Welcome everybody to uh, the next installment of IU's Ethics, Values, and Technology, a series called Developing Character for a Digital World. As you might recall, this is a special ser uh, series uh, funded thanks in part to the generosity of the uh, Lilly Endowment, exploring various um, ethical and uh, moral uh, dilemmas, frankly, in the cybersecurity as well as the broader national security context. We kicked off this series just a couple weeks ago with uh, Val talking to us from the Fi Cyber Future Society about their efforts at norm building around the world. Today, we're hearing from, uh, frankly, a global thought leader for decades in this space, and we're very lucky to have him, Professor Eugene Spafford um, from the uh, Purdue University uh, Department of Computer Science, um, who's really, frankly, been at the front lines and the digital trenches of these topics for, for many, many years now. Um, and we'll talk about kind of upcoming events here toward the end. But let me just briefly introduce um, and butcher, frankly, Spaff, your incredible background here. Um, but um, can make it brief. <laughs> we'll make it very brief. That's right. Um, uh, commonly known as Spaff, if that's okay, um, is a professor of computer science. Um, as I said, at, uh, at Purdue, joined the department way back when the world was young in 1987. Um, and uh, with background before that, and his degrees from the Georgia Institute of uh, Technology. His current research focuses on issues of computer and network security, cybercrime, ethics, technology policy, social impact of computing as well. I uh, was the founder and executive director emeritus of the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or uh, Sirius, which has a fantastic series, which I'd highly recommend for anybody who's interested in this field to virtually attend these days, so that makes it um, easier than ever. He was named as one of Purdue's first moral award uh, winners for outstanding career achievements. That's Purdue's highest award for faculty. And of course, Spaff has a, a huge number of professional accolades, which are frankly too numerous to summarize here. So as I said, and as you can, I'm sure attest, we're very lucky to have him today. Um, Spaff is gonna be talking to us about professional ethics and the government hacker, which is gonna be um, a lot of fun based on his experience um, both, frankly, in the public and private sectors, as well as academia. So, Spaff, over to you. Thank you so, so much again for doing this. And for everybody who's on the line, we'll be using the Q&A function to pose questions. So at any point, feel, please feel free to interject. And after Spaff concludes, we'll turn to that for discussion. So thanks so much again. Sounds great. Thank you, Scott. I very much appreciate it. I am going to uh, see if I can get the screen sharing to work here the way I want. and. Um, There we go. I think you can see the slide there. Perfect. All right. So, um, as Scott said, uh, this is a talk on professional ethics and the government hacker. And yeah. let me just certainly go here with the idea of um, an outline to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about. A little bit about water ethics and codes of ethics, just to put that in context and why we should care about it. And my talk is centered around the new code of professional ethics that ACM has established. And so I'll say a little bit about what ACM is and, and why that's important, uh, as well as the new code, and, and then talk a little bit about how that applies to someone if you're in a position of uh, responsibility and as, as an employee of government. Um, this could be a law enforcement officer, it, it could be somebody working uh, military or intelligence agencies, and how that relates to uh, the code of ethics of being professional, being in the uh, society with a little wrap up, and I'll certainly take Q&A at the end. So I'll start with this idea about what are, what are ethics and codes of ethics, and that's certainly related to the nature of this series, and has probably been addressed before and will be again. But let me start and just I'll define it as this way, that, that ethics are a systematic approach to making choices. And in particular, uh, it's helpful in, as a system for knowing what to do when there are diff difficult choices that have, have moral implications, um, things that, that may be troubling for you to make a choice or trouble others. And, and that is that ethics are really systems of principles that you can apply decision-making process so that you can come to the conclusion of either um, how do I achieve that which is good or most good um, or how do I know what's the right thing to do in a particular circumstance 
and, and certainly if you're going to study this, the formal method of looking at all these different systems uh, is called metaethics. It's a well-established branch of philosophy. It's either the oldest or second oldest branch of philosophy and thus of formal inquiry um, that we have a record of. Uh, and there are many things related to ethics, uh, accountability, principles, integrity, values. All of these issues have been used to apply to uh, making decisions on what is right to do. Yeah, and I mentioned meta-ethics, and um, there are subfields of ethics. There's, there's study in normative ethics and applied ethics, social ethics, and a lot of other things. And, and really where I'm focused here is on normative ethics. And normative ethics are those things that uh, is the guidance as to what you should do in any given situation. And professional ethics, that's what's expected of a professional in a particular field. Um, and there are a whole lot of reasons why we would have professional ethics, uh, particularly in a field where the public has to place trust in us. Um, in general, anything where we have a profession where people place trust, we want to have a set of rules that merit that trust and help reinforce it. And therefore, having professional ethics helps us do that. Normative ethics, uh, we all occasionally will run into situations where the answer may not be immediately clear to us. And, and having a system of ethics that we can apply, uh, having some norms and guidance can be very beneficial. Um, Basic ethics, the idea of applying it in any of the circumstances, isn't really simple. Um, we need some underlying goal that motivates our ethical thought. And there are a lot of formal schools of thought about ethics. So for instance, uh, one is the deontological view, which is, uh, let us do what is right. and how right is defined is a matter that uh, is, is often up for debate or has different interpretations. It, it can have guidance from multiple places, such as um, uh, from religion, from law, uh, from basic logic. Um, well, there we go. Oh, yeah. Um, another is we can choose to do those things that bring the best results. And that one way of looking at this is sort of the ends justify the means. This is also known as an ontological uh, system of ethics or consequentialism, depending upon the school of thought. Um, and, and these are basically systems where we try to evaluate what the consequences would be of our choices and our choice would be driven by the one that results in perhaps the most good for the most people or the most good for the least represented or I, there are a number of different versions. Um, I mentioned it could be based on religion and one that we've often encountered, multiple religions seems to be fairly uh, consistent and is, is, is actually consistent with uh, the ontological views is the uh, golden rule, the idea of generalizing your results so that you do what you would want to have done back to you or to those you care about. Um, and there are various justice-based uh, views where um, are we doing appropriate, are we providing justice for all? Um, are we providing the most relief to those who have the, um, the least say in what happens? And there's a number of, uh, of things here in, in justice theory. And, and many, many more. Um, if you study in this area, you will find lots of different um, uh, systems of ethics. And, and this is not intended to be a tutorial on that, um, other than to say that there are a number of different ways of looking at this. Uh, we don't all agree. Uh, our own systems that we adopt may be different from those around us. Um, in general, in uh, most Western societies, um, in the U.S. Uh, and English-speaking countries, uh, we tend to be towards the deontological side, which is uh, doing that which is right, which is specified as right, that is in the law, um, 
rather than the ends justify the means, uh, that's something that uh, we generally do not um, uh, embrace. And the saying, um, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it's how you play the game, is, is effectively what's built into our legal system and much of, <clears throat> much of our tradition um, within um, Western society. Uh, of course, there are some uh, around us who believe that ethics don't count, um, that you can do whatever you can get away with, you just have to accept the results of what happens as a result. Um, this tends to lead to chaos. It's uh, not a particularly good way to build a society, but we undoubtedly know a few people who uh, would take this approach. So, as I, as I started to say before, that our society is primarily based on these deontological principles. Um, and, but we also have elements of, of um, uh, ontological or consequentialism and justice theory applied uh, in a lot of what we do. And again, this is not a lecture on uh, the rule of law or how these are interpreted in society, but just to give you this sense that we have this underlying structure based on the uh, do that which is right um, because that's the idea behind laws and regulations and it's really intrinsic as you start to look at our legal system uh, for example the Miranda uh, decisions that even if you are caught red-handed with stolen contraband um, if if it wasn't according to uh, a proper warrant, and if you aren't read your rights, uh, that evidence can be excluded um, because the proper procedure wasn't followed. It wasn't doing the right thing. So as a result, um, our legal system looks at process. It looks at doing the right thing. And certainly we don't um, take, I had to follow orders or else something would happen because that's, that's a consequentialist argument and we, we don't embrace that, we never have. Uh, or whatever it takes to get a result, again, is not something that we generally embrace. Uh, we believe in rules, we believe in guidelines, uh, we talk about being a society as a rule of law. Um, and of course, as I mentioned about existentialism, of concern to the people who can do anything they want as long as they don't get caught. With that as a backdrop, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into that further here, as I said, um, there's this issue of professional ethics. And this is something common uh, across professional societies. Many organizations, uh, maybe even most, have a code of ethics or a code of professional conduct. Um, and the intent behind that as, um, stated in those codes by the members is that it's guidance. It is phrasing the expectations of what it means to be a professional in that field. What are the things that as a professional in that field we hold as the right things to do? How do we want to be seen by the public as behaving as members of this profession? And as I said earlier, this is to enhance trust, to make it easier for people outside to believe that a professional acting according to these rules can be trusted at least to the extent of working in their domain of expertise and their profession, um, that the members are all going to behave in an appropriate way, um, and it helps educate the public about what these organizations do. And I've listed some organizations here, some of which you may know, like the American Medical Association um, as an example, uh, but there are others, uh, ACM, IEEE, which hopefully many people here know, um, the National Education Association, the Society of Professional Journalists, um, accountants, and others. All of these groups have codes of professional ethics. So why do we care? Well, you know, this is a question that it's probably worth asking, although I, I would hope all of you can pretty much answer this. Um, ethics are important because as responsible adults, we're confronted with 
choices. Uh, sometimes it anticipated, sometimes not. And making the correct choices have consequences, as do making incorrect choices. And those choices can be very wide ranging. Um, the, the concepts of honor and trust are tied to ethical behavior. And in general, I would hope that people understand that having a reputation for being honorable, for being trusted and trustworthy um, are worthwhile goals. If we understand ethics, if we have a good consistent system of ethics that we apply, then we are more likely uh, to behave in a, a fashion that we can consider to be moral and to have others trust us because they know how we're going to behave. So uncertainty is one of the things where a system of ethics can help. Uh, because if we're unsure if something is ethical or not, it may cause us to delay in deciding, which sometimes turns into a decision of its own. It can cause us to make decisions and then feel regret afterwards or guilt. Um, or it can make us make poor choices because we don't really think through the consequences of the ethical considerations. And of course, it can certainly cause others to behave badly when they don't uh, follow a system of ethics or we don't work to help bolster their sense of ethics, their, their societal or professional ethics. Now, when I mentioned societal ethics, yeah, we have those two. There's professional ethics, there's the ethics of a society, which is uh, very often dynamic and are captured by uh, events, by popular movements, uh, by act actions of political uh, leaders, and uh, very often other kinds of social leaders. And it, it's what society will tolerate, what they will allow as proper um, through incentives and penalties, which don't necessarily have to be money or, or law. They, they can be issues of um, societal approval, for instance, popularity, uh, rank, other kinds of things. Uh, there are organizational ethics. So uh, within whatever organization uh, where you attend or are employed, there are undoubtedly a statement of rules of conduct as to how you're supposed to behave. And depending upon uh, the organization, those rules may or may not um, determine whether you can stay employed or stay where you are. Uh, some even can lead to uh, legal problems if you violate them. Professional ethics, which I've talked about, and of course, personal ethics. So there's all these systems of ethics and one of the problems is reconciling those ethics. And so uh, this seminar series is great because it exposes different views. And I think ethics as a, as a field is something everybody should think about uh, because if you don't understand your own system of ethics and how it relates to the organizations and societies to which you belong, uh, you will find conflicts or they will lead to some of those moments of indecision. Having normative ethics can help guide you. You can understand uh, which ones you should follow, when you should follow them, and when you should deviate from them. Uh, if you're going to be in a profession, having a set of professional ethics can help guide you along these paths. And so it's with that in mind that I want to talk about the ACM Code of Ethics. But first, let me talk about ACM because I'm not sure if everybody is completely familiar with ACM. Uh, some of you may not be computing professionals. ACM um, used to be known as the Association for Computing Machinery, but uh, now legally is just ACM, is the uh, oldest and largest uh, professional society for people working in computing. Uh, not simply computer scientists, but people who use computers, lawyers, actors, politicians. We have a lot of people uh, in other fields, doctors who are members of ACM because they see the role of computing uh, in their lives and in society, and they're interested in promoting that. It is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, global in scope. It is volunteer driven with a small staff and very focused on delivering to the members and to society at large. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things that I have shown here on the screen where places where you may have interacted with ACM um, and 
probably one of the best known is uh, the Turing Award, as an example, is given by ACM. Um, we also support the uh, uh, Computer Science Teachers Association, lots of publications, speakers, conferences, uh, and so on. Uh, last year, at the end of the year, there were nearly 100,000 members around the world, 51% of them in the US and the others shown there. Uh, about 25% of the members are students at the time of uh, joining ACM. And if you're a student and interested, there's a big discount given. So you uh, may want to consider that. It's about a 50-50 break between practitioners and researchers and about 20% female, 80% male, which is approximately reflective of the uh, gender breakdown in the field as a whole. Uh, but as a group, ACM is estimated to reach over 3 million people globally through events uh, that ACM sponsors, hosts, um, publications, and so on. A lot of that is in scientific scholarship, um, ACM publications. Um, there's a, a lot of those. Um, the ACM Digital Library has, as noted here, um, over, over a half a million full text articles and uh, bibliographic records for nearly 3 million. This was at the end of 2019 and it's grown. Um, it's, it's a major resource. If you're working in the field and you're doing any research, uh, this is definitely worthwhile. And uh, I'm pretty sure that Indiana University has a membership through the library for you to access these things if you need it. Uh, professional development, 170 conferences a year, 37 special interest groups for your particular area of interest, Q Magazine for practitioners, um, tech talks, webinars, books, lots of things. So um, if you're not familiar with ACM, it's a major organization for computing. It also has um, impact through things such as technology policy through public policy. Uh, there's the Committee on Professional Ethics that I'll mention in a moment. There's a lot of work that's done on diversity and inclusion. Um, and things in promoting special uh, areas of computing. So with that as backdrop, let me get to the code and what that means. The ACM has had a code of professional conduct, code of professional ethics, uh, since almost its beginning uh, back in 1947. Uh, the code was last updated in 1982, and in 2018, it was decided it was time for yet another update to take into account some of the changes that had happened in the profession and in the world. Um, so um, there was a, a committee put together that involved worldwide participation in a steering committee, and then it was opened up to the membership. So the code was revised in three rounds, and each of the first, uh, each of the each of the first two rounds, was presented to the membership globally for comment. And the committee that was working on this uh, read every comment and attempted to address it. This was an incredibly painstaking process because they received literally thousands of comments. The end result in that third round was something that when it was opened up for public comment, every part of it received at least a 97.5% uh, approval from the entire membership. Many of the changes received 100% approval. So this overwhelmingly represents a position of professionals in the field of all kinds in all countries and number of professions. The code itself is broken down into 25 precepts in four sections with a prologue. Every one of those precepts has an interpretation and guidance about how to apply it. And in published form also has some examples about how to apply it. I've put the URL here, and it's also easy to find with a search engine if you look for ACM Code of Ethics. 
Um, if you have not read it, I would suggest that you do. It, it is uh, really a very well done work. It has seven general ethical principles, nine professional responsibilities, a section on professional leadership and then compliance with the code. And that last one is at the heart of the title of this talk. So the general ethical principles hopefully are sort of, I won't say obvious, but things that you can just read and nod to. Um, but they're there for one of the reasons I said that a code of ethics exists, which is to present to the public what the values are of the profession. And so these are general ethical uh, principles for the profession. The first being to contribute to society and human well-being and acknowledging that all people are stakeholders in computing. Computing is not simply for the people who write code or build machines or sell the software. All people are. Computing affects everyone. And this was actually a change from the earlier version. Second, avoid harm, period. We don't define what harm. We don't say necessarily harm from computing. It's more generally avoid harm. As a professional, what can we do to avoid harm? Whether that harm is violation of privacy or safety or security or quality of life, it is a general admonition against avoiding harm. Uh, third, being honest and trustworthy. Uh, I don't think you'll see a code of ethics that says be dishonest and shifty, um, but we want to put this out front as an important value that we uphold and we expect members to uphold. Uh, be fair and take action not to discriminate. Uh, this was actually an interesting one in development because many people pointed, pointed out that discriminate, strictly speaking, means to be able to tell a difference. But here it's presented in the more vernacular sense in that um, we don't, we should not be uh, discriminating against any particular um, group of people uh, for reasons that um, aren't appropriate, um, that aren't fair. That's the be fair part. Uh, respecting the work required to produce new ideas, inventions, creative works, and computing artifacts goes to intellectual property. Uh, respect privacy was called out as an important principle, even though that is implied in avoid harm and honoring confidentiality. Professional responsibilities, I'm not going to go through all of these one by one, um, but in general, these are very similar to what you will find in any professional code of ethics about knowing your limits, knowing your profession, maintaining high standards, um, evaluating things fairly, only do those things that you're competent to do, help the public to understand what you do, um, and so on. So these are all um, pretty straightforward. And I think if you think in terms of what do we expect an, an, uh, an honest, uh, trustworthy group of professionals to do? These all fit into that category. There are also things that are not necessarily thought of all the time by some people who practice in the area. I think in particular, the perform work only in areas of competence, 2.6, is really important because we very often have people who think because they've studied one area of computing that they can easily pick up anything else. And that isn't, that isn't true. It doesn't work that way. Uh, professional leadership. As members of the profession, we realize not everybody in the profession is in ACM. And many of us are going to be in leadership positions. So what are things that we can do uh, to help set a standard and to help the public? So that includes talking about social responsibilities by members of the group, uh, managing any resources that we have control over to enhance public good. Um, create opportunities for others to grow as professionals. Um, and uh, take special care when we're doing anything with systems that may be um, integrated into the infrastructure of society. Um, 
these are these are all again things that as you read them you can sort of nod your head i hope and say well that makes sense that that should be in place and then compliance with the code uphold promote and respect the principles of the code and treat violations of the code as inconsistent with membership in the acm both of oneself and of others and it's that very last one that really gets to uh, the topic of this talk. Because during my career, I've spent a lot of time where I've worked with people in law enforcement and national security. The IC is the intelligence community. Um, and some of these people have duties. Their job would seem to be inconsistent with the ACM code. For instance, avoiding harm. Well, um, sometimes their job is to take down systems that are being operated by smugglers or pornographers or, or, or uh, similar. Um, about being trustworthy, uh, being truthful. Well, if you happen to be a, a law enforcement officer and you are pretending to be a 12-year-old girl online to catch a child predator, that's not being truthful, is it? Honor confidentiality? Well, if you're told things in confidence, uh, again, in a law enforcement comp, uh, uh, context where you're called upon to testify in court or swear out a warrant, um, you're breaking that confidence. So we can go through this entire list. If we go back here and we look at these things, um, we can, in fact, for respecting privacy, uh, it may in fact be the case that for law enforcement or for somebody working in a national security uh, role that they are expected to violate that as part of their job. Um, that um, here, working in areas of competence, yes, but fostering public awareness and understanding of computing and their consequences, uh, that, that may not be something they can do. In fact, they may not even be able to talk about what they do. Accessing computing and communication resources only when authorized uh, or compelled by the public good. I'll get to, that was added actually. Um, I was one of the people who suggested adding that. Um, these are all issues that, again, there are conflicts that would appear if you are working in a role that, that requires you to uh, um, get into a system, impersonate someone, or reveal confidence. Um, So with all of that, if you work in one of these fields, can you be an ACM member? Because violations of the code are inconsistent with membership in ACM. So how can you be in the ACM? Can you be in the ACM uh, if you work in one of these fields? And the answer is, well, yes, you can. Um, the overriding precept stated in the pro prologue, um, which I didn't put up, is that all of the code must be interpreted with the understanding that the public good is the paramount consideration. So there is a lens through which one views all of the elements of the ACM code, where the overriding concern is the public good. To act responsibly, ACM members should reflect upon the wider impacts of their work, consistently supporting the public good. Official duties, and here I'm being very specific because it's official duties, are in line with carefully considered laws and regulations, or should be, that reflect concern with the public good. So if one is operating within the law, then those laws were set up by elected representatives and officials um, relating back to fundamental rights and responsibilities in the Constitution and the public laws for the public good. So therefore, someone who's working in a position where they adhere to the laws, stay within them, and are for the public good is consistent with the Code of Ethics. Now, there's other guidance associated with each precept specific to it that helps give guidance as to how to interpret that in this context but they all come back to this basic idea. Let me give an example. 
Number uh, 1.2, which says avoid harm. Well, the guidance there says well-intended actions, including those that accomplish assigned duties, may lead to harm. That's acknowledged right up front, that it is possible that some harm can come about to some parties as a result of official duties. When the harm is unintended, those responsible are obliged to undo or mitigate the harm as much as possible. Avoiding harm begins with careful consideration of potential impacts on all those affected by decisions. But note, when harm is an intentional part of the system, those responsible are obligated to ensure that the harm is ethically justified. In either case, ensure that all harm is minimized. So this is entirely consistent with things such as the laws of armed conflict, that's what LOAC is if you're in the military, and regulations, is that if harm is intentionally part of a system, if you're in the military, you may be building cyber weapons, for instance, and, you're, and you may have to use those as part of a military uh, duty. If that's an intentional part of the system, you're obligated to ensure that the harm is ethically justified. And that's where things such as the LOAC and, and various regulations come into play. So we actually recognize that in the writing of the code that there are going to be circumstances where someone may have to cause harm and that in and of itself is not necessarily unethical. It's contextual. Here's another one, honor confidentiality. Computing professionals should protect confidentiality except in cases where it is evidence of the violation of law of organiza organizational regulations or of the code. That means if you're told something in confidence, it's supposed to be private and not shared, you should honor that unless it's providing evidence of a violation of law, of the regulations of the organization you're involved with or the code itself. So if you're a law enforcement agent having a chat online with someone and they say, uh, uh, can you keep a secret if I tell you? And you say yes and they tell you something, if what they tell you is evidence of violation of law, it's not a violation of the code to disclose that. Furthermore, the guidance states, in these cases, the nature or contents of that information should not be disclosed except to appropriate authorities. So that means to the extent that you can, you don't disclose it to everyone, but you do have the ability to disclose it to appropriate authorities as necessary to uphold law, regulations, or the code itself. And this happens to be completely consistent with works on uh, obtaining evidence, uh, government regulations on protecting confidential and classified information, and, and otherwise, in that you give it to those who have a need to know and have an organizational responsibility to receive it. You don't post it online, you don't share it with folks over lunch, what you do is you keep that confidence except where it's necessary to enforce the law, organizational regulations, or the code. Another example, know and respect existing rules pertaining to professional work. And the guidance says rules here include local, regional, national, and international laws and regulations, as well as any policies and procedures of the organizations to which the professionals belong. So this goes back to what I said earlier, as long as one operates within the laws and regulations governing one's work, it's consistent with the ACM code. Now that raises the obvious question, if you disagree with your organization's rules and regulations, then what? Well, then you're in a position that you have to consider whether you wanna to continue to work for that organization. Um, the code still talks about respecting those rules pertaining to your professional work. If, if you don't like the rules, and you can't change them, then you probably shouldn't stay in that job. Here's another one. Access computing and communication resources only when authorized or when compelled by the public good. That or when compelled by the public good, as I said, was something that was added because, and we added this guidance that under exceptional circumstances, a computing professional may have to use unauthorized access to disrupt or inhibit the functioning of malicious systems. Extraordinary precautions must be taken in these instances to avoid harm to others. So I, I don't know why I repeated that there, but um, 
the basic idea here is if you see that a system is going to harm someone, malware is present. Uh, it's, it's going to cause some kind of destructive influence. Somebody is distributing illicit goods. You can use the unauthorized access to disrupt or inhibit that because you are actually doing something for the public good. But you should take extra care that in doing so, you don't cause additional harm. All of the other elements have been considered with this in light because the revision process that I talked about had people in government, in industry, in academia, who had experiences in the military, in the intelligence community, in law enforcement, and that includes me. I was actually part of the drafting committee. We made the case during the drafting that lawful duties should not necessarily be considered unethical if they were carried out according to proper regulations and law for the good of society. Although we want members to reflect on whether those laws are appropriate. And this goes back to things such as um, some of the wire intercepts and uh, uh, other kinds of things that were uh, controversial after 9-11, uh, uh, that that whole bit about eavesdropping and so on, there should be consideration given about whether that's appropriate. But within that context, it is not specifically unethical to follow the laws and the rules. Um, and really, if we go back and we look at that, the fundamental idea is to help for the good of society, for the good of people. If we take actions against those who threaten our lives and safety and against those who would break the law to commit fraud or hurt others, then those acts shouldn't be swept up under such strict admonitions of do not. Because we have this to act responsibly, they should reflect upon the wider impacts. That's the paramount goal. That's the underlying structure of the ACM code. Of course, if you're one of those people and you're in this situation, you have concern about your work duties, well, what do you do? Well, this is what I said earlier. If you're in that position, talk to your supervisors, talk to HR, talk to somebody else, and understand the context of what you're doing to the extent you can. I mean, have you been fully briefed on the nature and scope of your work? Maybe you're misunderstanding what you're doing or how it fits into things. Sometimes a conversation can clear those things up. And the second is you don't go and you talk to other people who aren't appropriate about this. Um, if you're in an environment where you're dealing with law enforcement sensitive material or classified material, you shouldn't be talking about these issues with somebody who doesn't have those appropriate clearances. Generally, every organization that has that sensitive material uh, has someone that you can go talk to, for instance, in human resources. Uh, in the military, uh, and interestingly, and at, at uh, some of the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, they actually have, uh, through the offices of the chaplain, the clergy, they have individuals you can go talk to there uh, who are cleared and who will give advice uh, as one example as well as some of the people through the typical HR offices. Uh, so there are avenues where you can go talk to people if you have concerns. And ultimately, if it bothers you, you can ask to be reassigned or leave and take a different job. Uh, the most important thing is to realize not to step outside the bounds and in so doing necessarily endanger yourself. What about whistleblowers? Well, that's a whole nother issue that could actually be the topic of another talk. Um, and I didn't really address it in these slides other than to say that's kind of a rough road to head down and you better be absolutely certain uh, that you understand exactly the context of what you're working with and why it bothers you. Um, uh, in closing, let me just say, if, if what I've presented to you makes sense, if you'd like to think of yourself as a professional, if you want to support your career, support the profession. Um, help educate others about what the computing profession is about. Give some thought to joining ACM. Um, in doing so, you adopt this code. It makes those as a set of principles that you're going to follow. And having seen them, I, I would think and hope that you would agree, they're not really that onerous. They're actually good things. And if more people followed them, 
we might be actually a little bit better off as both a profession and as a society. So check it out. Um, I'm, I certainly will admit here that, that I have a bias in that I've been a member of ACM for 43 years. I'm a life member, a fellow, I've served on council, I help write the code of ethics, um, and uh, I'm currently chair of ACM's publication ethics committee. So yeah, I have some stake in this, but that's also because I believe in it. And um, I recommend that you look at it. Uh, with that, I'm done with my formal part of my presentation. I'm going to switch back here and take a look at chat questions. Fantastic. Well, first, how about a, a virtual round of applause, at least, because Pat, that was fantastic. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. Um, covered a lot of ground. And as you said, the, the, the questions are already coming in here. Um, I had a couple as well at, at, to kind of round this out, but I'm wondering, would we start with maybe Zig Ziegler there? I'm not sure if you can see it or I'm happy to paraphrase. Uh, yeah, I can see it here. Um, so, um, computer systems and software have a well-deserved reputation for being deployed in a buggy state. Yes. With products being distributed with known vulnerabilities or commercial shortcomings. As software continues to consume the world, these issues have ever greater impact, potential harm to society. How does this practice get measured against protecting the public good? Great question. Um, <clears throat> the problem is an awful lot of developers aren't professionals in the sense of um, having deep training in this area. They don't know where the faults could be. Um, they aren't members of ACM, um, which is not an excuse. Um, we have a lot of things broken with our whole software environment in that um, right now society values features and companies value first market more than people value safety and quality. And that's not only true in software, that's true in other places. It's an area where we have a disconnect between social valuation and to some extent social ethics and um, the, the ethics as I put forward from ACM. This is where some of the leadership principles come in, where those of us who are professionals need to do a better job of educating people about better practices in software, about the dangers in software, about building in safeguards, about trying to encourage our colleagues to be better educated, to have continuing education, certification, and, and other such things. It's an incremental process. Uh, we had a sea change, for instance, in automotive engineering uh, around the time of the Pinto uh, release. And at the same time, seatbelts, eh, same era, they're pretty close. Seatbelts and Highway Transportation Safety Administration and some other things all came into being that basically changed public attitudes towards safety with automobiles. Not completely, but there was a major change. We haven't hit that moment yet in computing, but we're getting there. I think with IoT, with uh, ransomware is just a huge problem with the interference in our elections, all of these are beginning to register with the average person, hey, there's a problem there. And this goes back to the fundamental reason for professional ethics. We want people to trust us. And right now we're not giving them products that they can trust us uh, for. And we need, we need to do a better job of, of communicating how to get it right. So that, that's, that's not a carefully thought out answer. That's a quick answer. Um, I hope that at least gives you a sense of where my thinking on this is. We all need to do a better job of this. And part of that is we need to exert more leadership talking about quality and safety. Mm -hmm. um, Simon, how can ACM code fix the creation of a uh, filter bubble and the spread of hate speech? Oh yeah. Um, no, this was not in consideration during the redrafting. Um, how can the ACM code be applicable to machine learning software um, and is Facebook complied with the ACM code? All right, so you've got three things there. Um, <clears throat> so the whole bit about filter bubble and hate speech, 
Um, that's pretty complex, and I'd have to think about that a little bit. In part, we want to encourage the idea of freedom of expression and not compelling people to read things that they don't want to read. So when you have a system like Facebook, it <clears throat> exacerbates that uh, in that it allows people to say whatever they want with little responsibility for consequence. And it gives them powerful filters to only look at what they think they want to see, which may not be true. Um, this is a problem. And it has always been a problem. We just make it possible at a larger scale now. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that's so much an ethical concern per se as, as it exposes a larger concern about are we using the technology to improve uh, people's existence? Uh, is entertainment an improvement as much as education is? Um, where does fairness fit in? Those are difficult questions, and they're not really addressed by the code, but we should be thinking about them. Um, machine learning is similar. Um, ACM's public policy group just recently issued a statement saying that we shouldn't be using facial recognition because as a machine learning, uh, we can't do it well enough yet. It, it has consequences that may be damaging. I, uh, we have a committee looking at issues of algorithms, AI, and machine learning, and that's a whole area where there, there are problems. Um, much of the machine learning that goes on can't be explained by the people who are writing the algorithms and the data. And so uh, we have this, um, we have things like self-driving cars that kill people, uh, and we can't really explain why that happened, uh, why it made decisions where it did and uh, adversarial machine learning that leads to problems. So um, the difficulty there is that we're moving research into a production environment where it can hurt people far too quickly without safeguards in place. And that's where the code is applicable. Not necessarily on the design of the machine learning, but on the marketing of it too soon. Uh, and then last of all, is Facebook complied with the ACM code? No. No, that's simple. Docker. <laughs> And the queue's open as well, guys. So I'll just fill in with a couple of other questions. We don't have a lot of time left. Um, but you kind of mentioned, especially in the role of a government hacker that you kind of provocatively titled it, um, SPAF. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering your thoughts in general on the vulnerabilities equities process, which we kind of talk a little bit about in class as kind of an interesting balancing act between kind of national security needs and the efforts to you know, toward kind of defending forward and frankly stockpiling cyber weapons against, you know, the need to better protect all of us and actually patch vulnerabilities and inform vendors of the, you know, vulnerabilities that uh, government officials are made aware of. So I, I'm kind of wondering, that kind of roughly fits in the ACM. I'm just kind of hypothetically thinking about somebody on the government workforce who's involved with, you know, this process, who's also a member of ACM and how you see them kind of balancing some of those competing needs. Well, that process is always evolving, as I understand it. Um, I don't have inside information as to how, it, how it's uh, decided. But I think if we look back over the last six months in particular, um, one of the agencies that we normally uh, associate with this, the National Security Agency, now has a new directorate that um, is intended to be outward facing and helping the public and industry with cybersecurity issues. And they've released several warnings of zero day vulnerabilities after the vendor has fixed them mm -hmm. uh, that they could have kept and potentially used, mm -hmm. but whatever process they had internally, they judged um, that this is more danger to the, to the public. Uh, now, I, I don't know where that judgment came from, mm -hmm. but they have made that judgment and they have in the past as well, although perhaps not as publicly as, as this. Uh, sometimes they would release things to vendors and then vendors would announce them. Uh, it, it, is, it is an interesting uh, balancing act mm -hmm. and it's difficult unless one has access to knowledge about all the various capabilities that they have already. And there are other capabilities. Mm -hmm. So um, one that has been discussed, the whole idea about backdooring encryption. Mm -hmm. um, there are organizations that don't really need that because if they can get to the information 
before it's encrypted, it doesn't matter if it's encrypted, right? Um, and in fact, it may make things harder. Uh, so, so there's an equities issue there that requires a lot of detail that I don't think any of us have. Um, we have to trust in the professionalism of the, the people who have been doing this for some time, and they recognize the importance of protecting the public. That's one of the reasons they take on these jobs um, and uh, swear the oath of office that they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's or at least we hope. Yeah, right. That's, <laughs> maybe, that's some, why. maybe some positive progress there. Um, and just maybe one or one or two final points. Um, you kind of mentioned corporate social responsibility a little bit, and I'm I'm kind of wondering. You know, there seems to be a little bit of a movement to kind of pivot away from thinking of cybersecurity just either as a cost center or using cost benefit analysis to figure it out and lean maybe toward the direction of thinking about it as a competitive advantage or even kind of a corporate social responsibility. And I, I, I've heard about a few organizations, for example, that are starting to talk about, you know, technology as part of their integrated sustainability reports. So kind of the impact of their operations on the digital ecosystem, as well as kind of the natural environment, for example. And I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to that overall, you know, burgeoning trend. Is that a useful exercise? Does thinking about it in kind of CSR terms, does that detract maybe from um, other, other potentially more useful, you know, lenses to use here? Um, this is going to evolve uh, again. Uh, part of it has to do with simple matters of economics as well as awareness. Uh, a lot of MBA programs don't don't teach, for instance, about security is really a process, mm -hmm. um, and um, rather than a cost center, uh, it, it isn't an ROI issue. Yeah. Um, where we are seeing progress actually being made is in the area of laws around privacy. Mm -hmm. Because to maintain privacy, we have to have good security. And with things like the GDPR uh, and the recent laws in California and New York and I think Connecticut on uh, online privacy, that's pushing organizations towards improving their security, just as GLB did a couple of years ago mm -hmm. towards financial system privacy. HIPAA mm -hmm. has done so towards medical record privacy. Um, once we start seeing some large penalties applied, I, I think that's going to bring about more of a change mm -hmm. uh, in, in this realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I, Absolutely. it's hard to predict. Yeah. Because, because some of us have been seeing this coming for a long time, but it's very slow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Maybe so I've got another question here. Yeah, 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 please. Uh, are there other resources you might recommend to help a person integrate ethical considerations in their day-to-day -day work? <clears throat> well, there's there's a lot of, there are other organizations that have ethical considerations too. Um, there are lots of books that have been written on this. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest thing that you can do is, the most important thing, is give thought to how you base your decisions, given choices, and practice them. Um, mm -hmm. being able to exercise that, that moral muscle, uh, as it were, uh, requires exercise and requires practice. It's thinking through. Um, there are books that you can find, uh, yeah, certainly in the library or, or otherwise, that have lots of case studies. You can look at cases, some real, some made up, and ask yourself, well, what choice would I make in this? And then look at the analysis and look at the consequences and think through how how you would behave in those. Um, that's probably the best thing you can do on this rather than simply read through a set of rules is actually think about how they'd apply in your own life. Yeah. I like that, I like that. And, and that might be even a good point to end on um, in case, unless you have any other kind of final reflections. Um, um, there. If, if something uh, occurs to someone that uh, they didn't have answered or, or a uh, wild idea that comes up, they're welcome to send me email. I'm easy to find online. Uh, I can't promise an immediate response. I get a lot of email. Uh, but um, uh, this is an area I think all those of us, uh, and, and you know, we, can, we haven't made any jokes about Purdue IU here. Um, we are colleagues. We, almost we are made professionals. It. That's right. <laughs> uh, 
if it was a basketball game or a football game, we might have some comments. <laughs> but we're all working towards common good and towards making society a better place. And um, this is something, if you have questions, you have people locally, you have people outside, ask questions, ask advice. Uh, there are people who can give you advice and you can think through and, and how to do this. This is, this is very important. And for many of the students here and for many of the others, this is the world that you're going to live in for the next 40, 50, 60 years. It's important that you do the best you can to make sure that the right decisions are made early on because they will change your world and your future. And make sure you're registered to vote. That's right. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, one more virtual round of applause for Spat. That was absolutely great and a wonderful finale. So thank you so much, Spat. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. And we do have a lineup of upcoming events as well. I just put the link in the chat box there unless uh, folks are curious. Tomorrow, we actually have a special conference on governing the commons, including lots of work on knowledge commons, even some space commons stuff with more than 1,200 registrations already, my goodness. Wow. So, uh, and then besides that, a lot of upcoming events on election security and in this series as well. The next one is with Amanda Craig from Microsoft on the 29th. So we look forward to that. Spaff, thank you so much again and have a great evening and to everybody. Thank you. Be well, be safe. And as Fab said, don't forget to vote. <laughs> Thanks again.